Hello, everybody. Welcome on InnoOneSoccer.ca. You're watching One Soccer today. Andy, Ollie, Gareth, the three amigos with you as per usual. And gentlemen, it is right around the corner. These friendlies against Qatar and Uruguay for the Canadian men as they continue their prep for FIFA 2022. Um, let's see if we can focus in on some players here, right? Because I, I, I know John Herdman was a little bit more general when he said, you know, this camp, it's not like players can necessarily play themselves off the team but you know it is a way for maybe new call-ups new players to catch our eye play themselves in um so you know it's it's not going to be maybe as earth-shattering as we think but we know that for players individually this is a big deal for them they want to go to their first ever world cup so i'll begin with you wheels which canadian men national team player do you think has the most to gain from these upcoming friendlies uh, first off, this is a great time. This is so exciting. Uh, just having the men's national team back less than two months ahead of the World Cup. And there, there's so many great storylines to cover. And what I really hope uh, from this is that the fans across this country get galvanized. They come together and get really excited about what's ahead here. Um, Alfonso Davies is my answer, but we're going to speak about Alfonso Davies in a few moments time. So I'll pivot to, to the biggest storyline other than that, heading into this camp, and that's the midfield area. Canada Soccer announced Wednesday that Jonathan Osorio hasn't traveled overseas. Atiba Hutchinson, not there either. When Ollie, you and Andy, like when us three are sitting here on this show on a regular basis, we're kind of plotting out who's going to play the biggest roles at the World Cup. Those are my first two of my first three midfielders that I that I consider putting into the team. And neither one's going to be there. Now, that doesn't mean that Atiba and Oso are going to miss out on the World Cup. But I think when it comes to plan B, this is a real opportunity for someone to step up. Ismael Kone is the name that jumps off the page for me. He was dynamic. John Herbin trusted to play him ahead of more senior players in the final World Cup qualifying window as well. He clearly has caught the eye of the coaching staff and the players within the Canada camp. You, you know what to expect from a Sammy Piet. You kind of know what to expect from a Mark Anthony K. But Kone's the one player who seems like he can not only work his way into the 26 going to Qatar, but could potentially work himself into a role as well. What if Atiba can't go come the World Cup? What if Osorio can't go come the World Cup? This is a good time to figure out what exactly you have just in case. Yeah, I, I've gone along the same lines, and I think there's two kind of obvious answers to this. And what one, they're both CF Montreal players. One is Kone because he's kind of the the wild card maverick option with a ton of talent, who's you know even at a young age could potentially step into a role here, like Gareth said, because of the absences or potential absences that that could could exist there. Um, I'll go with the safer option though, where I, I think which is is Saint Piet, and and I think it would be a massive gain on Saint Piet's part, even though you're right, wheels, we kind of know what we're going to get from him. Because this is a player that only started two games in the octagonal. And one of them was cut short by injury in the first half. So we've gone from a point where it maybe seemed a little bit like, you know, with some of the quality of the midfielders coming through, Eustachio joining the program, that maybe Sam Piet was becoming more of a depth player, someone you can always trust and, and rely upon, but maybe not someone who's going to start in your big games. So now I, I think he's he's in the running. Um, you know, depending on, uh, obviously, a team is going to play if, if he's fully healthy and fully fit. But once you get beyond that and you start talking about Mark Anthony K and Azorio and players like that, based on form in, in MLS this season, Piet has to be in that conversation now rather than being that guy who comes off the bench yeah. and gives you 20 minutes at the end of games. So I think he's someone who who has a massive amount to gain. Like you, like you said, Andy, no one's going to be knocked out of the squad um you know permanently or anything like that based mm -hmm. on this camp but players can certainly advance their cases i think uh against caliber of opponents like this yeah with piet though well like wouldn't you prefer him to be that player you know if if you're level if you're up a goal then you bring on piet to, to, to ideally be the closer yeah. ideally For you sure. want him in that role that's why i think kone just provides a, just a different level of player that's maybe a little bit more dynamic if Eustachio ends up sitting a little bit more, um, it, it, it it depends on the shape of the team as well. I think we pretty much know how they play, how they rotate defensively. So a defensive double pivot can work. Herdman has used that um, in, in bigger games as well. Some of his biggest games against the United States, Piet's come in and played a role as well. So it's not like he can't play that box in the midfield, but I think ideally he'd be a player that comes off the bench. But I know this for a fact, Herdman's been watching, he's been communicating with Piet over the last few months, and his stock has absolutely risen in the Canadian men's national team. 
I do want to go back to Jonathan Osorio, not that I wanted to bury the leader or anything, but you're right, uh, Wheels Canada Soccer coming out and saying that he has not traveled to Vienna, Austria. We know that he went roughly a month um, sitting out for Toronto FC. He had last played, I believe it was August 20th, and then he came in as a sub September 17th for 18 minutes. And clearly something happened even in that game where he didn't feel right to the point where he is not reporting to camp. And I understand that there's still time to work with. We still have over a month to go, about a month and a half until the World Cup starts. But are you getting concerned for, for the player? Not, not, not so much the conversation yeah. about what is this midfield going to look like, but are you starting to get concerned that Jonathan Osorio for himself may not be at the World Cup? Yeah, um, and, and that's where my concern is really. Like we can talk about the team and, and tactics and all of these different things. But when you when a player comes out and says he's been struggling with a neurological dysfunction, as he phrased it, he was in concussion protocol in July as well. Like you, you just, you wish the best for the player, right? Like those types of things aren't, aren't nice and they can be pretty scary. And not least at this kind of time in your career where you're in a contract year, you've got a World Cup coming up. I imagine that's causing you know, a fair bit of distress right now for, for, for any player, right? So, um, yeah, best wishes are with Jonathan Azorio and, and hopefully we can see him back and playing for, for Toronto FC before the end of the season here. Canada needs him. Yeah. Canada desperately needs him just in terms of the type of player he is. Uh, his game has completely grown, adapted, evolved. He's been trusted in big occasions. Uh, at the Azteca, was wonderful against Mexico in qualifying. Um, mm -hmm. You know what you're going to get. And he'd be one of my you know, 14 outfield players that would receive regular playing time at the World Cup, taking out him, potentially Atiba as well. Like those, those are two massive holes, not on, only in terms of experience, quality of the play, but reliability as well in those big games. Other than the obvious, which is, well, get wins. What would be considered productive in this window here, Ollie? I, I actually don't think getting wins matters all that much here. I'm, I'm not really what? that, that cons I'm not that concerned about the results in this window. Of course, results are nice and maybe they play into what I'm going to say um, in terms of confidence and, and good feeling and things like that. But I just think coming off June, like we just need to see a focused window, a productive window where, you know, the, the team plays two games, the performances are good, the intensity is good, the togetherness is there again. Uh, and we have the proper focus going into the World Cup. And like, you know, this, this team hasn't been together a lot and played together a lot over the past few months, right? We, we qualified in March. Then it was a, a really broken up June window with everything that was going on off the pitch. The game's getting cancelled. You know, the game in Honduras, which was basically a waste of time, in, in, in my opinion. So there's not been a whole lot of opportunity for these players to be together, to be really focused on their preparation for the World Cup. Um, since qualification. So I think it's a crucial window in that regard, just getting everyone on the same page, may making sure there's the understanding of what John Herdman is going to ask them to do going into these World Cup games uh, and just kind of rebuilding that chemistry. I, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's still there and, and you know it doesn't go away that easily. But but that's the side of it that I want to see is, is just intense performances, focused performances. The result for me, you know, this isn't the time where Canada needs to get results. This is the time when they need to build their performances to get the results at the World Cup. Um, and mm -hmm. proving that you can hang with a side like Uruguay, I think that absolutely matters. Yes, you might not necessarily need to win that game, but I think you need to be able to prove that you're willing to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, punch for punch with the big boys. And some of it, Andy, we're not going to be able to assess because – we heard John Herdman say there were these five specific areas that they're focused on. The coaching staff's focused on in terms of hmm. improving or closing the gap between them and their competition. What are those five areas? Because that's how John, John Herdman is going to assess whether it's been a successful window or not, whether they'd be yeah. able to close some of those gaps and achieve what they're set out to do. And none of us quite know as of right now what those five areas are, but hopefully that will become more clear as Herdman speaks uh, going in and uh, and around these games. Maybe it'll become more clear where exactly he wants to play on the pitch, Alfonso Davies, because, you know, in the beginning of the World Cup qualifiers, he was moving him around and, you know, he was asked, where do you best see Alfonso Davies? And I believe, and I'm paraphrasing here, gentlemen, but I think Herdman had responded, when you have a player of that caliber, that quality, he can play where he wants, right? Because we saw him up front, we saw him at the back, we've seen him as a wing back, we've seen him taking, you know, the, he's taking corner kicks, he's taking free kicks, he's done everything um, that he wants to do with his Canadian national team. However, however, 
and maybe that maybe that is the answer maybe versatility continues to be the answer but wheels i am curious how do you get the most if you're john herdman out of alfonso davies against higher quality opponents it's it's funny with all these canada preview shows and articles like i've seen very little spoken or written about alfonso davies the player that's most critical to overall success whatever that may be for canada at this world cup alfonso davies is the best player that canada have it has and uh, the most versatile as well. And when Herdman says that whatever worked in CONCACAF, you know, throw that out the window, I, I think he's right because Davies only played in half those games. Now he has his biggest weapon. And where to deploy Alfonso Davies is the million-dollar question for Canada. Mm -hmm. He is not a left-back for this side. He will not be play playing left-back. Does he play off the left and give him free reign to play behind a back two? Uh, does, does he join... Uh, join the attack like how is he best utilized and for me Ollie, i don't know if if, if you agree and and i have no idea if herman's thinking about this i want my best players in central areas that can day to control the game that's in the middle of the part right now and i don't think that that's necessarily in a two in central midfield alongside stefan and eustachio i could see canada playing a 4-4-1-1 and davies occupies that space in behind uh, Jonathan David with a little bit more freedom to roam, pick his spots, be more influential from the middle of the park rather than the wing. That's probably how you get the most out of Alfonso Davies um, and benefit Canada in an area where right now they're looking rather light. Yeah, I think that's an interesting idea, and I and I could see it. You know, I, I think we already have seen it in moments, right? Alfonso Davies playing yeah. much more centrally for for country than than he does for club. I, I have a feeling, to be honest with you, it will probably vary on the opponent they're going up against, right? Like, I think there's areas where you're going to look at Croatia and Belgium in those first two games, and 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 target weaknesses um, with Belgium. That may be that their back line is is a little older uh, and not the quickest, and Davies can potentially cause them some problems. Croatia, you look at the big strength, it's the central midfield three, right? Maybe you want to play in the wide areas a bit more. And we've heard John Herdman talk about, you know, the wide areas and the ability of not just Davies, but Buchanan and Larea and Adekubi to combine uh, as kind of being Canada's superpower and, and, and their X factor. So there's different ways I think you can go about it depending on, on the opposition. Um, it's an interesting one, though. Like, I don't know that there's been that many teams. I'm sure there's some examples and, and, uh, and we'll probably look at them going into the tournament. But I don't think there's been that many teams who have been like a pot four team who hasn't qualified in ages and are seen as a big underdog and yet have this player who is arguably like a top 20 player in the world right now, right? It's an interesting kind of balance. Um, and obviously Canada's Canada's real potential difference maker. I, I, I want to see him playing between the lines, picking up the ball and running at a back line. Same thing with Jonathan yeah. Davies. Those are your two best players. I don't think there's room in, in, in a preferred 11 against Belgium for Laren, Ugbo, some of the other attacking players. And Herman said very, something very interesting in, 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 his, in his, you know, after the squad was announced. He said that he wants to test some of these wing players to see if they can do the work defensively as well. So you have Buchanan down one flank. I think you could put Lorea down the other flank as well. But he wants to see who else maybe can play a more versatile wing role. Not a traditional fullback or wingback but potentially like a traditional outside midfield role for this team. That's how I think he's looking at things. Again, that's mm -hmm. just my assessment of things. I Perhaps Herman has other plans, but I think that that makes a lot of sense based upon who you're playing at the World Cup. 